Remember the, I think it was two times ago when I spoke, and how I talked about angels, and that's why I love my church. We had a bunch of stuff happen up here this morning that I can just look back and say, that's why I love my church. And I'm going to say it again. For any of you out there who are seeing this, boy, I'm really loud, Matt. Anybody out there who's, who's seeing this, if you need a place where you will be immediately accepted, you will be loved no matter what you've gone through, no matter what you're going through, no matter who you are, what you've done, you are welcome here. Come and share the love. We will hug on you. We will love on you. We will pray for you. We will support you. And this is where you belong. Okay. That was an unpaid, unsolicited, uh, by the way. And I also get a big kick out of the fact that we, um, the praise and worship team, as soon as we're done, you see we all huddle up there. We're talking about all the mistakes we made during <laughs> praise and worship. So <laughs> thank goodness God just loves us for making a joyful noise unto the Lord. Because if we got penalized for every state, mistake we made up there, we would not get to heaven. So... Anyway, I'm just going to call this, and it's, it's kind of good because it's not an especially long message today, um, but I think it's a very meaningful message, something that God's been laying on my heart for a while. And so when Tim asked if I could speak this close to Christmas, I, I was delighted. I thought, okay, that's a perfect opportunity. But I'm going to call this uh, Questions of Christmas. Let me pull this a little closer here. I'm going to be like Kurt and just take this thing and make it my own. So I'm going to start by reading one of my favorite Bible passages of all time. And it's uh, Luke chapter 2. If you want to pull it up and read along, you most certainly can. Okay? We'll start with verse 1. And it came to pass in those days that a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. This census first took place while Quirinius was governing Syria. So all went to be registered, everyone to his own city. Joseph also went up from Galilee, out of the city of Nazareth, into Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was with the house and lineage of David, to be registered with Mary, his betrothed, who was with child. So it was that while they were there, the days were completed for her to be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. Now there were in the same country shepherds living out in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. And behold, an angel of the Lord stood before them and the glory of the Lord shone all around them and they were greatly afraid. Then the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. For behold, I bring you tiding, good tidings of great joy, which will be to all people. For there is born to you this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign to you. You will find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth, peace, goodwill toward men. So it was when the angels had gone away from them into heaven that the shepherds said to one another, Let us now go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has come to pass, which the Lord has made known to us. And they came with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in the manger. Now when they had seen him, they made widely known the saying which was told them concerning this child, all those who heard it marveled at the things which were told to them by the shepherd. But Mary kept all these things, pondered them in her heart. Then the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things that they had heard and seen and was told to them. And since I was a little boy, I've wondered a lot of things about Christmas. And so I just want to share some of those questions that I've had. Why in the world would God Almighty made man be 
be laid in a trough where animals feed out of. Number one, why in a manger? He was the king of kings, the Lord of lords. Why not a palace? Why did he have to arrive the way he did? Why not on a brilliant white steed with lightning firing out of his eyes and and, and angels behind him in legions blowing trumpets and, and doing all these glorious things, glorifying God. Why? Why did he have such a meager, meager beginning? And why in Bethlehem, tiny little insignificant Bethlehem, why not in Jerusalem? Why not in Rome? Why not hear you? Okay, Romans, here we are. Bang. Why? Born in Bethlehem in a manger, laid in a trough. And why did he come as a baby and not a king? Why not a full-grown man? Why didn't he just walk out of the woods one day and, you know, start performing miracles? Why? Why did he have to go through what he had to go through? So, and why was his birth first told to, of all people, shepherds watching over their sheep? As we all know, we talked about this before, back in those days, shepherds were about the lowliest profession that you could get. They weren't highly paid. They generally weren't brilliant or anything like that. But what they were, were fiercely loyal to their flock. Fiercely loyal to their flock. So I pondered these things, and I pondered these things, and I pondered these things. And finally, when I guess God knew that Tim was going to ask me to preach before I knew, he started revealing a few things. So I'm just going to share with what he revealed to me. If God would have brought Jesus in as a mighty conquering warrior on a horse with angels and trumpets and lightning and all that stuff going on, right? The ordinary average person would have thought he was untouchable. He was unapproachable. He was way well beyond them. And he is. But because of the way that God made this happen, and because of the way that he brought him to earth as a baby, as a child, and laid him in a wooden trough, he is suddenly... Every man's Jesus. He's everybody's Jesus. He's not just for the mighty. He's not just for the wealthy. He's not just for the learned. He's not just for the religious people. He's everybody's Jesus. He laid him in, in, think about this. He laid him in a wood trough. So he was born being laid on wood. He died being laid on wood. And what did he do throughout his life? He was a carpenter. He worked with wood. His entire life surrounded in wood. Death, life, birth. I would love for somebody to research that and find out what that significance is. That, unfortunately, God did not reveal to me. But think how God works in symbolisms all the time and in tiny things to, make, to deliver a message. Here he was, 
born on wood, died on wood. The Savior of the world. Maybe that's it. Maybe God knew that he was going to have to die on wood. So let's make the story complete right from the beginning. We're going to be born on wood and you're going to die on wood. But I found that to be amazing. And how about the shepherds? Again, poor, uneducated, loyal shepherds. And how about this? God didn't use kings or wealthy people or priests or anybody else to be the first ones to spread the good news of Jesus Christ. He used poor, out-in-the-field shepherds. And I think that's very powerful for today's day and age. That's a very powerful message for us. We don't have to be educated. We don't have to be priests. We don't have to be pastors. We don't have to be kings. We don't have to be wealthy. We don't have to be anything. All we got to do is be us. That's all they were. They were just them. They were poor shepherds out in the field. And they were the first ones to go out and spread the news and tell everybody a new king has been born in the city of David. And that's why I think it's so wonderful about Tim in this house and how he empowers all of us to get up here and do exactly what I'm doing today. Because that's what we're called to do. God made that call when he had the shepherds be the first ones to spread the good news. God made that call, not anybody else. God made that call. And then, just in case we needed a reminder, Jesus gave us the Great Commission. So God the Father gave it to us at the birth of Christ, and Jesus gave the Great Commission to us when he was getting ready to leave. What power we have because of a baby, a tiny infant who needed help with everything. Helpless. Imagine that. God Almighty made man helpless. Couldn't eat by himself. Probably had to be rocked to sleep. Couldn't you know, sleep by himself. All the things that babies are in today's world, he was back then. Amazing. And I, th- I, think it was, I think it's also very, not only unique, but powerful that Jesus often referred him to himself as the shepherd. Always referred to himself as the shepherd. In John chapter 10, verse 11, he says, I am the good shepherd, and the good shepherd gives his life for his sheep. So, again, the context there of God first revealing the birth of Jesus to a shepherd who then became the the ultimate shepherd. And I also saw two different... I I didn't know there were two. There are two different places in the Bible, Matthew chapter 18, verses 10 through 14, and in Luke 15, 1 through 7, where... It was revealed that Jesus said, if the shepherd is watching over his flock and one goes away, does he not leave the 99 to go find the one? And when he finds the one, does he not rejoice more over that one than he did over the 99 that stayed? Tying all that in, This reminds me of how amazing God works in our lives. How how he he somehow, again, reveals to shepherds, Jesus becomes the great shepherd. The first people to talk about Jesus were the shepherds. And what did Jesus do as the shepherd? He spread the good news. Everything interweaves and It's amazing the way all this happens, and God makes it happen, and sometimes we don't even know what's going on. You know, we don't even realize it. One of the things I do every morning when I get up and I pray, thank you, God, for another day, for the gift and blessing of this day. 
and for all the gifts and blessings that you will bless us with today, even the ones we don't even realize. Because he does, he blesses us often with, with blessings that we don't even realize. There's another thing. He was born among scandal. Think about it. Mary was conceived by the Holy Spirit. She was an unwed mother. An unwed mother. And Joseph, had he not had a dream, a visit from an angel would have taken off. Would have, he had intentions, the Bible says, of divorcing her. So there was a whole lot going on there with that. And I think what God is trying to tell us among all that is that it doesn't matter what scandal you're coming from, what problem you're in, what mess your life is right now, what you've gone through. He's still your king. He's still your savior. He's still your hope. He is your light. Amen. He is your light. I love John uh, chapter 1, verses 4 through 5. It says, In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. That light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. Remember that. It doesn't matter how dark it is. That light is there, and darkness has not overcome it and will not overcome it. I had a friend recently who got to the depths of despair that he drank himself into almost an alcohol death. Had a chance to see him. His brother found him, thank God. His brother found him, got him to the hospital. They got him revived. They got him into um, outpatient rehab, everything. I just got to see him this past Wednesday. And I, was, I shook hands with him. I said, yeah, you're looking really good. How are you? And he said, Mark, I can't tell you how good I am. And I said, what happened? And he said, well, while I was in my state of near death, Jesus came to me and said, I have plans for you. Stand up. Be bold. Together. You and I will get through this, but I have plans for you. I haven't seen this young man that happy, that full of joy, that full of peace in 20 years. And that's how God operates. He brings us up. He raises us up. From wherever we are, whatever we're doing, however bad we've got it, he raises us up. And it began at the birth of Jesus. And so I wondered, when was the first time that we were told that this was going to happen? God, somebody told somebody somewhere that he was going to be sending a Messiah, right? Yeah. Well, I found it. It's in Genesis, the very beginning, at the very beginning, after the fall of man, God said to Eve, I will set up your seed after you, who will come from your body, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. So God the Father, that's why he had to come as human. There's your answer. We humans messed it up. You see, when God created the Garden of Eden, it was nothing more than an extension of heaven. It was, it was meant to be nothing more than an extension of heaven. God would walk, walk in the garden with Adam and Eve. 
was nothing more than an extension of heaven. And then when we messed it up, God knew that that wasn't going to be the first mess up. And he knew it wasn't going to be the, the last time that Satan tempted people and deceived and lied and tried to manipulate and control. He knew what was coming. And he knew even then that he was going to have to bring a Savior. And he knew that the Savior, since it was man who sinned and man who broke that connection between heaven and Eden, it was going to have to be man that brought the connection back. That's why he had to be human instead of coming as God and just absolving everybody and, you know, knocking Satan and his legions back down to hell. It had to happen this way in order for everything to be right. So as you, as you work through your, your Christmases, and everybody's like Tim said, everybody's got stuff. You know, we have, we have work and we have school and some of the kids have exams and, and you've got Christmas parties and Christmas uh, office things and then you've got Christmas meals and family gatherings and, and you've got decorations and you've got gifts and all of these things that are going on and Christmas is all around us and, and gigantic Christmas displays everywhere you look. And out of all that, Try to remember that God made Christmas really small. He made it really tender, really sweet. I love that line in, in the uh, song, Mary, Did You Know? When she said, when you kiss the little baby, you kiss the face of God. He declared it in Genesis. He made it happen in Luke in a tiny town, in a manger, with a Savior who had to die on wood, being born on wood, and working with wood all his life. And by the way, what do people do who work with wood? They build things. They fix things. They make beautiful things out of a cut-up tree. Aren't we all in this game of life sometimes just a two-by-four? And don't we get beat and hammered on and cut up and marred and made imperfect a lot? Yeah. Well, Jesus comes and takes those pieces of cut-up, beat-up, marred, charred, brutalized, two by fours, and builds something amazing. And it all started in a trough in Bethlehem. So keep everything soft and sweet and simple this Christmas. And thank God for making you and taking you as cut up and brut brutalized and beaten and burnt as you are and being thankful to him that he's building something really, really beautiful in you. And just like my friend, he has plans. He has plans for you. Just like he had planned for Jesus. Just like he had a plan for the shepherds. And let's be those shepherds. Let's be the people who go out and talk to other people about Jesus. Let's be the one to go out and, and be, be proud and share the news. And you don't have to stand on the corner and thump a Bible or get a microphone and scream it. You can do it every day of your life just by talking to the people that you live with and the people that you work with and the people that you run into. Everybody just put your hands out like this. Dear God, we just thank you for our Lord and Savior who had to be born on a piece of wood and then had to die on a piece of wood. And we thank you that you 
And Jesus and the Holy Spirit take us, marred, cut up, beat up, burnt pieces of wood, and you form us into something beautiful. You build palaces and castles, and you build homes in our heart full of warmth, full of feeling, full of love, full of caring. And let all that just flow out from us this Christmas, just like the love and the warmth and the feeling and the caring and the joy spilled out from those first shepherds, the first to tell the good news of Jesus. Thank you for the blessing of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ as we celebrate his birth here at this time frame. We give you glory and praise and honor forever and ever. Amen.